Over the weekend, troops of the Nigerian army arrested about nine people advocating for a Yoruba nation following a gun battle in Oyo State. The agitators invaded the Oyo State Government Secretariat in the Agodi area of Ibadan, Oyo State capital. They occupied the location and attempted to overpower security operatives at the State Assembly complex and the entire Secretariat. They also removed the Nigerian flag within the assembly complex and hoisted their own. They were eventually overpowered by security operatives after a shootout. Yoruba Nation activist Sunday Igboho and Yoruba Self-Determination Group leader Banji Akintoye have condemned the invasion. This development has generated fresh conversation about breakaway demands across the country. What needs to be done to put an end to this trend? Will all aggrieved sides be able to come to a meeting point? Well, for more on this, I'm joined by my guest, Wale Adedayo, a member of the Afanifere Publicity Committee, and Honorable Eugene Odo, former Speaker of the Enugu State House of Assembly. And in our offsite studio is Dr. Mike Omeri former Director General of the National Orientation Agency. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so let's start with um, you, Mr. Dedayo. Um, we've all, all heard the story last weekend that some agitators um, stormed the Oyo State State uh, uh, House of Assembly. Well, it was the Federal Secretariat, but the State Assembly was also within that location. And they tried to hoist their flag and declare a Yoruba nation. What do you make of that failed attempt? Some of them have been arrested now. Now, to me, first and foremost, as a person, what happened there is a failure of intelligence. That the our security operators, especially those of them in charge of intelligence, they should have gotten wind of something like that and be able to prevent it. For them to have been able to penetrate that place, to me, is a is a failure of intelligence. But on the larger scale, I mean, looking at something that they're talking about Yoruba nation and things like that, even if everybody should agree that let's come to the table, let's talk, people like that won't be part of the delegation that will sit at, at the table. It's not it's not just possible. But I think we need to look at what is giving birth to things like this at this time. Because if you cast your mind back, 1999, that was when uh, things like this were happening too, and even on a much more larger scale. And I'm talking about the period when the OPC was very active on the street, and a Yoruba man was president at that time too. To me, I see two things here. One, um, a poor understanding of governments and its activities by a number of disgruntled youths or youths who are angry with the way things are being done. Then the second one, which also is the responsibility of the security agents, the activities of third columnists. You know, people who try to fuel this kind of discontent. You know, you have unemployment issues, you have so many things. But the thing is that how much understanding do these youths have about what is going on? And who are the people that are supposed to create this understanding for them? Find uh, somebody from NO is coming on, on board. To what extent have we gone in terms of reorientation or educating our youths about what is going on in the country? Okay. To me, these are just the two major things. Okay, Honorable, um, although let, let's come to you. You are from the Southeast region. And that region has also witnessed a lot of restlessness for many years now. The leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP, Mr. Namdekano, uh, was arrested by the federal government uh, because of that, because he was viewed as causing trouble and instability within the country. He is still in the custody of the Department for State Services. Do you agree with how the government has handled that matter so far? Well, um, naturally, he's been charged for criminal offense. And when somebody is charged for criminal offense, ordinarily the person ought to be prosecuted. But the difference here is that 
this man has been granted death severally and he's not been uh, access to enjoy his bail. Even the previous bail that was granted to him, he was enjoying it when the military invaded his house in his village. And Ransak died, and of course we, we all heard of the casualties that happened. The young man ran for his dear life. And part of the charges being brought up even as a present is that he joined bail. When somebody is joy, uh, enjoying his bail, ordinarily, the next thing to do is to have the person have his day in court. And he has never missed any court. So, when we talk of restiveness in the Southeast, it is not strange. Wherever there is injustice, it is very difficult to have peace there. If you go to Palestinian, if you go to Haiti, if you go to Sri Lanka, if you even the recent Ukraine issue, once there is injustice, it is very difficult to have peace. And this is not peculiar to Southeast. If you look at what happened in South South, the South South felt that we are the people producing the soil that is feeding the nation. Because virtually no state can take care of itself. But we are here languishing in squalor. We are here being riddled with uh, environmental hazards. And they continue the agitation, agitating until they were able to insert in the constitution the derivative uh, principle, which confers 35% of a state allocation to them. Not only that, they were able to establish NDDC to develop Niger Delta. You now see engagement from government. But the difference here in the Southeast is that however you cry, nobody cares. And naturally, they were marginalized even from not just by mere physical approach, but even by the Constitution. A situation where most of the state has 60 states and only Southeast has only five. By implication, you simply know that if, you are, if the states are getting like 10 million, while other states are getting 6 million and others are getting 7, Southeast is getting uh, 5. So there is no way you can beat a child and stop him from crying. And more so, they are the most nationalistic set of people in, across the country. Right. going by the kind of business they do thank right. you very much yeah. uh, dr omeri is in our offside studio can you hear me dr omeri thank you right you. okay so um let's come to you now um at the set of independence in nigeria the northern part of the country was slow in embracing the new independent state but it seems now or you know they they are more invested in one nigeria why do you think that is the case? Well, um, thank you again. If the North, as you claim, was slow in accepting the concept and fact of independence as it is, uh, then, then and now they are more interested in uh, you know, a united country. It is because they have seen, seen that being together as one entity pays and therefore they are ready to pay not just the price and it's not just our independence remember the quest for keeping nigeria one was as far back as uh, immediately after the 1966 coup so uh, this story is coming from a long trajectory and what i see going away from this question now is that we needed to have uh, promoted a narration or a narrative in this country that is uh, you know, promote that is about our nationhood, about our statehood, about our unity and oneness. That a be, being, a, you know, one Nigeria is better, is bigger, is uh, advantageous. Now, but we didn't do it for a long time across the regions, across every community. So what we have ended up with and what we are seeing today is that various communities started describing themselves as states. Every tribe describes itself as a state or a nation, a Lago nation, a, a, a Thief nation, Ibo nation, Yoruba nation. These are, they cannot operate within a nation, a country. 
if you have a country, a nation state, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a combination of all, all of these. So because we do not agree to the nationhood of Nigeria, that is why people are beginning to describe themselves as nations. You cannot have a nation within a nation. And that has been tolerated over time by governments and everyone. And I'm sad that even elites have joined in it. You know, you find elites talking about their own nation. When we are, we are supposed to be talking about Nigeria, they are supposed to, they that know, that ought to encourage their fellows who do not know to talk about Nigeria are also talking about their own nation, Igbo nation, Yoruba nation, Thief nation, Alago nation, uh, Egon nation. This is not going to create the kind of nationhood that we need to progress this country. So we need to, uh, to create a, a deliberate narration that will ensure that we take ownership in mind, soul and, and practice you know, of this country. It is possible to do it. The institutions to do so are there, you know, but we are not utilizing them simply because our attention has been diverted to how do I get rich, how do I survive today. That is just a challenge and unfortunately all the governments have not taken that into consideration in order to design a strategy to arrest the trend. Now the trend is almost becoming a part of the national uh, icons of this country. And that is not correct. Dayo, let's, let, let's come back to you, Mr. Dedayo. Um, if you have read the news, you hear that um, Chief Olabade judge, he condemned the invasion of the Oyo State Secretariat. And he described what happened as treason, an act of treason. Do you agree with him or do you think that is a stretch? Ordinarily, you call it treason. But like he pointed out that it's not just in Yoruba land or Southeast or even South South alone that things are happening like this. What you need to look at is what is bringing out these things. It's like a number of people don't feel like they have a sense of belonging. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, like we'll he rightly said. So that is what I I don't want to agree with uh, Chibodi George that is prison at all at all. It's not. You need to understand what is going on and how do you solve the problem. That's what you should be talking about. And you also said that the people that were involved in that invasion, if there was going to be a discussion about the Yoruba nation or about the fundamental questions of Nigeria, they will not be on the table. What do you mean by that? No, what I mean by that is that at the level in which they are, definitely they won't be there. I mean, that, that's, 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 uh, that's a given. But the one you mentioned about you, Brother George, I think... Maybe he's talking because he was a military man. He's using a military background to talk. If he's talking as a politician, which you should have spoken like, you need to understand what is going on, what has happened, and what kind of solutions you want to prefer. If people don't have a sense of belonging, then it is necessary for other agencies of government or those who are in government to try and find a solution to that. How do you make them have a sense of belonging? How do you make them feel that they are part of this corporate entity called oh. Nigeria. Okay. Because those who say they are, there's injustice here, it, injustice from where? Is it from your local government, from your state, or from the federal government? You understand what I'm saying? Yes. That's just it. Uh, Honorable uh, uh, um, Odo, when you look at the Southeast region, some have said that, or IPO, for instance, has said they want a referendum, you know, to have an independent state. What do Igbo people generally want? Do they want an independent state or you feel they're better off within a Nigeria that is more just? Yeah, the average Igbo man is very comfortable with this country. The average Igbo man is a believer of the Nigerian projects. And looking at uh, the kind of businesses they do, looking at their way of life, they are the most single tribe that has gone as far as developing every part of this country. I was in Gamborun Gala some two months ago. I saw an Igbo man building personal house and it's even possible that he hasn't even a house in his village. If he doesn't believe in this country, he wouldn't do that. But what the average Igbo man needs, yeah, but an average Igbo man doesn't need to be, he doesn't need to be done any favor. He doesn't need to be conferred any advantage or cashment. What an average Igbo man needs is free economy, free advantage, equal opportunities, fairness to all. 
because they believe that they can compete favorably. They believe that the, the Nigerian project is more accommodating for them. But the absence of fairness, injustice, of course will make somebody to retrace his step to say, look, do I still belong here? Because if you say that what belongs to me, that I cannot be part of it, then why don't I look for a way to chart my own course? That's exactly what is happening. And then what do you see what Namdekan is doing? Namdekan is not a political office holder. In fact, before now, about five, ten years ago, he's not known anywhere in the, in the southeast. The people they know is so the people like Owazrik and the rest. But the truth remains that his message resonates with the people. So much so that it has outweighed whatever a governor, any government function or senator, anybody can do. And the people, if somebody come and tell you that, look, you have five states and other have six, you now may doubt the people. When you look at this, find out that it's true. If somebody tells you that, look, you have about 10 local governments and there are other states, like uh, maybe Kano has about 40, then you find out that it's true. So his message resonates with the people. And the people, these people of South East are very much interested. If they are not interested in Project Nigeria, how would they be investing in all new sacraments of the country? Okay. Dr. Mike uh, or Mary, um, let's come back to you. The, these agitations are all over the country, including the North, um, on different levels, political, economic, uh, religious, ethnic, and otherwise. Do you think that Nigeria, at this point, needs a referendum? Well, um, first, I wish I can also react to some of the comments I'm hearing. I and, heard, uh, but be brief. So, and, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, briefly. Briefly, I, I find those comments as part of those part of the issues that divide this country that are causing nobody has stopped anybody from you know taking if it is politics or aspiring to any political leadership, you can do it. You can look for people across the country to like your idea, to like your person, to like what you want to introduce, and have people vote for you. Peter Obi just tried. Uh, Bola Tinibu just tried. Even when Obasanjo came from the southwest, he just tried and he got it. So it's the approach to leadership that matter in determining who gets what. Now, if we want to reduce this concept of ownership of space or to a sense of entitlement, then we have a long way to go because there are, there are over 250 or 300 tribes in this country or languages in this country. And they, are, they have their own history and sense of originality. Therefore, they have a right to also begin to agitate to the presidency or to the leadership of this country or to ownership of a few things here and there, otherwise the country will not survive. Now, and that is where I said we needed to build a national culture that embraces everyone. It does not matter whether, if we say Kano has 40 local government areas, my, entire, my state, that I know the population is more than 3 million, uh, 3 million people or 4 million, 5 million people. But we have just 13 local government areas. Bielsa has 8. So what should they do? Jump into the sea? What should we do? I'm also from the north, not central, from the middle belt here. What is my agitation? All I need, so long as the provision of services, the provision of opportunities are open to all Nigerians, including me and those who are disadvantaged, who are in the far-flung villages, uh, villages, you know, I don't need to be in charge. Those who have been in charge, how have they helped their own people? They have failed. They have neither helped, they have not helped their own people, they have not helped the communities. What we need, you know, now is consensus leadership that knows and operates within defined principles of what we were or where we want to go as a nation. There are advantages in all our spaces, economic spaces, political spaces, and so forth and so on. We need to take advantage of it by defining a national culture. If we are saying that we don't have advantage, someone else, so who is owning the country that has to share the advantages to us? Who is owning the country that has to share the opportunities to us? We all belong here. So it's what we do that will give us what is our entitlement. And what is the entitlement we want? The entitlement is that we, own, we all together have a country and we have the, the, the heritage and the, the environment to be proud of and utilize towards getting what we need as citizens of this great country. But if we hold the 
uh, these divisive things in our minds to begin to seek for power and opportunities, believe me, it will be so segmented and we will have, we'll be taking small, small fragments of the opportunities instead of the whole. A lot of people mm -hmm. have asked for, for uh, you know, the separate uh, co uh, countries, separate. If they go there, are they going to operate as a monolithic uh, uh, society? It's not possible. Even the Southeast that they are talking about, they have other, other people, the Ebony people and who claim they are not Igbos. We have read this history. So if they go there, they are going to, how would they accommodate them? And there are so many other variations of Igbo, there are so many variations of Yoruba, there are so many variations. In the in Hausa land, there are many variations the Fulanis have. In the Middle Belt, we are so many. So how, what we should concentrate on today is how we can bring all of these people to believe in the concept of a Nigeria that provides for everyone. It Dr. is possible to do so. Okay, thank you. Dr. Mike just talked about a sense of entitlement. Do you think the Yorubas feel self-entitled? President Bola Tinubu is the president today. And then in 1999, a Yoruba man, President Olusegun Abasanjo, or general retired, became president. So the Yorubas have been in the corridors of power fairly. So do they have a sense, a sense of entitlement? It's not a question of sense of entitlement. Like I pointed out earlier, you know, I pointed out that of Abbas and Jordan and what was happening at that time. The thing is, like he also rightly pointed out, it's not just happening in the southwestern part of Nigeria alone, and not just southeast or south south. Here up north, it's happening here in some other forms too. Religious forms, land forms, you're talking about bandits, you're talking about Boko Haram. The bandits, that there's a reason why that is happening. Farmers versus herders and so on. But he, I think if he has enough time to conclude his statement, I think, to me, I'm not a mind reader, but where I think he was going to is that there should be a sense in which leaders, maybe across the states, local government, and even at the federal level, especially those who are holding political appointments, try to do things in a way that will make their people feel a sense of belonging, that will make people feel as if not one side is favored, this side is favored, or the other side is favored. So the question of uh, sense of entitlement you are talking about does not arise. We have a, a Yoruba man as president, yeah. and we've also had in 1999 for two terms. Should they be asking still for a Yoruba nation? Oh, to use, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. To use what you are saying, if we are to go by the terms of what you just said, sense of entitlement, then that thing should not be happening. What, is, what happened in Badon should not have happened. That means they feel they are entitled to the president. They are the one there now, so there's no need for any agitation. But like I said, it goes beyond that. When President Muhammad Buhari was there, banditry and so on was happening up here in the north, just as it's happening today. So it's not a question of saying, my mind is that. Well, until you solve the primary problem, which is what I pointed out earlier, that you need to find out why is it that people are not feeling as if they belong to this corporate entity. So why do you think they are not feeling so? No, it's not just in the bad alone. No, it's I'm just saying at least you're from the southwest. Why are they not feeling so? <laughs> it doesn't matter that I'm from the... I'm from the what I believe is that there is a need for all of us, one way or the other, to come around and talk together again. Just like it happened pre-independence. That this is what we want in the common law document that binds all of us together, which is the 1999 constitution. You understand? Some people want religion. Some people want the question of land. Some people want some other things to be there. So if we come together, okay, this is the kind of government we want. This is the way we want to be represented. Like, for instance, a number of uh, elderly people prefer the parliamentary system of government. In parliamentary system of government, it's not a question of winner takes all. Meanwhile, if you are not popular at the grassroots level in your village, there is no way you can make it to the federal level. Okay. So uh, we have to look at all of this. It's not just a question of uh, using words and uh, Honorable, uh, um, Honorable Odo, obviously, um, part of the problem is a leadership question. Do you think our leaders have their heads buried in the sand and refusing to resolve the issues? And also, Dr. Mike talked about Ebony people not being Igbos. How do you react to that? Well, I think... Uh, I didn't want to interject that truly. No Ebony person has ever denied that it's not Igbo. The Igbo state includes five states of the southeast and even extend to Delta. 
If you tell me that uh, Delta people say that I not even can agree. If you tell me that uh, uh, River State people say that I not even even though they answer Ibo name, I can agree. But what we simply need is good leadership. We are not banana republic. If we want to face our problem, we must start from the ground norm. And what is the ground norm of Nigerian law today? That is the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999. You recall that it was an overflow of the 1979 constitution. It is virtually in pari material with um, the 1979 constitution. And this constitution was created by virtue of Decree 24 done by the military. So Nigeria never on their own set out to write even a constitution. So if we must be realistic, we need to have a conference for people to sit down. This constitution, we are not written by us. Then, what do we want to do? The several amendments of the Constitution by National Assembly is merely retroactive. But we also had several conferences in the past years. Yes, there were conferences, but none came to fruition. In fact, the only one that nearly came to fruition was that of um, uh, the one Jonathan did, which was uh, somehow uh, which was somehow abolished because he never signed it it was concluded. What Nigeria need to do is to sit down the entire ethnic nationalities the South, South, South East, South, South, and, and what have you. They will sit down and discuss, and now come and talk what their concerns will be. If you read the concern of Nigeria, it started with we, the people of Nigeria. That's a lie on the surface of it, because the people of Nigeria never sat down to write anything. It was one attorney general under the military, assented by the then military junta, that gave us a constitution that we are using today, and even all the states that have so far been created, were created by the military. Okay. You're watching Arise Prime Time. The conversation continues with my guests in the studio. Stay with us. Welcome back to Arise Prime Time, where we offer perspectives on the news and talking points of the day. I'm Constance Ikoku. Well, we're still taking a look at the issue of ethnic agitations in Nigeria, and my guests are still Wale Adedayo, a member of the Afeniferi Publicity Committee, and Honorable Eugene Odo, former Speaker of the Enugu State House of Assembly, and in our off-site studio is Dr. Mike Omeri, former DG, National Orientation Agency. Thank you for staying with us, uh, gentlemen. So, Dr. Mike, let me come to you. Um, we usually hear Nigerian leaders say that the unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable. It's a very common statement. And um, what do you think about that statement in view of the fact that it seems that efforts have not been made to really back that with work? I mean, yes, we should be united or Nigeria can be united, but it's not a military decree. You cannot decree people to be united. What's your view about that statement? Well, in the first place, Nigeria did not come about by a military decree. It came about by discussions, by, uh, you know, uh, negotiations and so forth and so on before we had a country. And before I moved there, I remember the story of Akanu Ibiam and how he was made governor of the East Central State or Eastern State that of those days. It was to allay the fears of the people of Ibonyi who didn't want to go with the Igbos. This common knowledge is there in, in history. I, I read history. I have a PhD in history. I cannot begin to make frivolous uh, comments on national TV in relation to that. Now, back to this matter. Um, you know, where, when a nation was negotiated from the colonial rulers, it, at that point, we would have opted to go our separate ways. Perhaps the, the power of the, the, of the colonial masters, of colonial uh, raiders of that time, you know, forced us into what eventually became uh, in Nigeria. And all of us came from various backgrounds, north, south, um, not, even the north, they are, you know, the middle belt, it, has, it is largely colorified with different culture and all of that. And then the, 
the Hausas also had different culture, and the Fulanis that came later in the 1800s also came with their own influences into uh, this country, the Igbos, the Yorubas, and everyone. Now, if since then we are not able to develop a national culture of doing things, and, and in fact, there, there, there are only few social spaces that we're able to do that. One is football, I know that. Then the second most important area where we all collaborate and behave like Nigerians is when we want to be corrupt. And then these agitations that you see comes from a few people. My upcoming book, which will soon be in the public space, we try to trace the history or the story of, of such agitations. And believe me, a few people can cause a lot of apprehension within the, the polity. And that is what I see. A few people came together, they are armed, they went to a place to get the attention. It's a deliberate planting. But once you see that happening, someone somewhere is beating the drum for that kind of thing. Look at the leader speaking on, uh, uh, you know, share the viral video everywhere, and he's speaking from somewhere abroad. So if once you see some of these things, somebody is beating the drum. But in Yoruba land, I wouldn't want to say that the entire Yoruba people are in support of what I have had senior Yoruba people say, let us look at what is feasible. Is it federalism? Is it a breakaway, a cessation, and so forth and so on. They should know what they want. If they, can, if they want to stay within Nigeria, let's work together to stay within Nigeria. The North, if they want to stay within Nigeria, let's work together to stay within Nigeria. So goes with the Middle Belt, with the Igbo, with everyone. There is so much that we can gain by being together. Perhaps that is why some people are saying it's non-negotiable, because of the kind of resources we have, not just the natural resources, but the human capacity when we work together. I have seen uh, that in, with collaboration and um, exploitation of our own talents and knowledge and all of that, we can do a lot to improve our social species, our natural species, and so forth and so on. This is what we need, and that is what the country uh, needs to have. And that is what the, con the government, that every one of us, Yoruba, Igbo, uh, Tiv, Alago, Egon, Mada, everyone, you know, have subsumed or have, have agreed to give a part of their freedom, a part of their power to a structure of governance in order to help deliver. So what, where we, what I see is this not about this tension that you see. It is because government is not delivering on what it ought to do at all levels. We find people now running into their ethnic uh, or religious, uh, you know, who come to try to to lord it over other people or to try to convert everybody to do as they want. That is not democracy. That is not what government is all about. And you see the officials of government in many instances trying to enforce these kind of things. We are not looking, uh, we didn't allow our powers to go to a government in order for the government to come and colonize us and enslave us. Let democracy thrive. Let us be Nigerians. Let us see each other first and foremost as human beings capable of doing good things. Then we now can solve the problem that comes with the bad things. But if all of us are now living in, believe me, across the country, everyone, sadly so too, that the problem, the complaints are shared by every, the same complaint, the elites, the rich, the poor, everybody, we, are, we have the same complaint and that is dangerous. So the government should now pay attention. We have, fortunately, there is the National Orientation Agency, like you mentioned, fund it. It has mandate. The mandate of that agency is, is beyond just communicating government policies, programs, and activities. It has so many things to do. Fund it properly and give it a, the matching orders to deliver. Okay. Let us, see, let us see a repetition of this narrative everywhere. Okay, okay. So, Mr. Dedayo, um, let's come to you again. President Bola Tinubu, in his early political life, he was very um, vocal about Nigerian state and the way it's organized or constituted. He was one of those that were asking for sovereign national conference. Of course, later it's said that we have a national assembly, so whatever decision has to be made needs to come from a democratic institution. Since he came into power, it doesn't seem he said much about restructuring, which was the word. Why do you think that is so? I don't think it's up to here he got into office, and I think uh, first things have to be tackled first, which I believe is the economy and political stability of the nation. But I believe that with the 
one or two directions in which the administration is moving. You know, heard about state police, uh, which is part of the items on the restructuring agenda. I have no doubt in my mind that something like that is going to happen uh, very soon, that there will be a move towards that. But that's precisely what he was saying. I'm talking about the former DG of the NOA, that at some point there will be a need for us to sit again at a round table, either through the National Assembly or through like what was done during President Goodluck Jonathan uh, time. You, so yeah, from my friend, if are you giving us information that what is actually going to happen? No, no, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I mean or this is what you would not, want to see. That's that's what I feel will happen because we are hundred percent in support of restructuring. We are hundred percent in support of the people of Nigeria coming together like we did before independence. That look, let's chart a proper course. But like he rightly pointed out, it is not Nigerian people who sat down to write the 1999 constitution. It was done by the military. Just like the question you asked before that uh, the unity of Nigeria is not negotiable. No, you can't even take that to the United Nations. It will be thrown out. Because at the United Nations, they ask you to go and do a referendum. Once referendum is done and people feel they are moving away, it's okay with the UN. Honorable uh, um, Odo, unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable. Life is about negotiation, isn't it? Well, before I tell you to your question, I must uh, put on record because this is a national television. The Ebony people might have cried for marginalization within the Southeast, but at no time we are they have they made move that they are not Igbos. See, if they are not Igbos, what are they? Are they a BBO? Are they a FIC? So let us put that on record. Now, as per the negotiation of uh, the country, I think. Um, that is, a, that is a statement of fallacy, so to say. Nobody can say that the unity of a country is non-negotiable. As a matter of fact, seceding in a country is not a criminal, is not a criminal offense. It's just done in Britain. There was Brexit over there. And then what you see now as a European country, Netherlands and uh, a lot of countries, they were divided. So, and uh, nothing came out of it. So to negotiate is a good thing. But nobody can blanketly say that the unity of a country is, non is negotiated and it is based on mutual understanding. They've all made their useful suggestions as to sitting together to discuss. Because, like I said at the opening speech, the moment you fail to realize that there should be fairness to all, the moment you kept on perpetuating injustice and you say that it's not negotiable, that means, in fact, that in itself is even impunity. So what we are saying is that we would prefer a situation where Nigeria remains together, especially the South. The South is basically prefer Nigeria and be remain together. But remaining together must be on the basis of fairness, must be on the basis of justice, must be on the basis of free economy, must be on the basis of entitlement for all Nigerians, not just Igbos. Free play, free economic play, free political play. For instance, in the last administration, the Igbos has cried about marginalization, that they were not giving this, they were not giving that. And it appears to continue. Even if you watch the recent ministerial appointment, every geopolitical zone, irrespective of their numerical strength, six and seven, got extra two ministers, and if, or one. But in the Southeast, they just gave only the Southeast. And you tell me that it's not negotiable, that people will not be annoyed? I mean, that, 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 that will be begging the question. People must be realistic about what they say. You cannot own things collectively with somebody and you believe that this person is part of it, and you denied him what is his legitimate accrued right, not even stop loss age. And then you tell him that you're forcing down on him that he must be part of it, even though you're, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Okay, Dr. Mike, back to you again. All that I'm hearing this evening or this night shows that Nigerians do not have a common vision. And that has taught the country's progress. When you don't have a common vision, you're not going in the same direction. It is a problem, obviously. How do we now build a common vision for the country? See, before now, 
Nigeria had a semblance of what you call common vision. And that was why the regions developed at the, their own paces and they were doing peer, peer, uh, a peer review or something. And everyone, they were competing among themselves to try to be the best, to outdo each other. But they, they had a forum where they all sat to discuss or agree on things. Here, what we are having, we are divided into 36 component states. People are talking about, even recently I had some members of the National Assembly talking about a return to the regional parliamentary kind of thing. Is it three regions that we are going to return to, or 12 regions, or six regions? Because any, re any parliamentary thing that we return to the three regions, we will not agree, oh, not every one of us will agree to that. Because we have grown, uh, we, are, we, are becoming, we have become oversized. So you must give me a middle belt one, you must give uh, the, uh, what do you call it, is it um, Midwest, then. You know, these things were even proposed at that time. The Willing Commission was meant to solve some of these problems of agitation of whether they belong or they did not belong. It was all in, a, in an effort to create that national vision. So we can yes, be, sorry, we, we, is, sorry, isn't that why the late Chief Alex Akweme came up with the sick geopolitical zone? which yes. seemed like, you know, more representative of the country. Yes, as centers of development. They did it, it was not, it's not in the constitution, it's not a constitutional thing. It's just something that Abacha accepted and just by, through a speech, pronounced these regions and they, they are, we were using them for convenience sake. It's not in any, any law of this country. In fact, any action taken on the basis of that can be subjected to, to, to legal, uh, legal question or interrogation. So, but we have come to understand, since we are liking it, we have accepted it as a part of our procedures for things, it can simply go into our laws. You see, so that is why when people talk about uh, having to sit down to converse, it is from the things that we do ordinarily every day. This is how laws are formed. They are not, you don't bring something and force it on people. It is what they do. So when you agree to put what you do in, in uh, you quote them, and then you begin to go against it, that is when you break the laws. So that it becomes easy. Laws, governance and government are supposed to make things easy for citizens. And that brings me to these this agitations that we are seeing, pockets of agitations that we are seeing all over the place. I am I'm not seeing where government is deliberately making things easy for citizens in Nigeria. I'm Nigerian, I have worked in government, all the governments. Every one of them is looking for how to make things difficult. You cannot see intervention in the transport system, in healthcare, in all of that. So when are we going to see it? After 200 years? Okay, okay, thanks. Let's come back to you, um, Mr. Dedayo. It seems that Nigeria is yet to recover from the civil war, if you ask quite a number of people. And it's something that... How do you mean? Uh, let me land. It's something that some feel that should be discussed so that we can heal from it and then move on. Do you think it's absolutely necessary to have that conversation and then have a closure and see whether Nigeria can work together as a big entity with different groups within it? You know why I ask you the question that why, why do you think Nigeria has not recovered from the civil war? He mentioned something now about the region that if Nigeria should go back to the three regions that we know go Greek, that was a bad word to use. And the way he was using, I'm sure it has to do with his uh, Middle Belt region before he brought up the idea of the six regions. If you are talking about the civil war, you might want to go back to the coup of 1966. Because that's when the unification decree came about. And that's what abolished everything that our fathers agreed to before independence. That was, to me, or to a number of us, that was actually destroyed whatever we had on ground before in terms of calling for restructuring sovereign national conference and so on now so the question the is the unification of nigeria the so kind of system we run now the question is can we the, the, the question then is, the question then is since after that civil war yeah. how can we recover because it looks like we're still stuck there what i'm saying is that you've not really explained that how do you mean that Nigeria is yet to recover from the civil war? And I just took you back to January 15, that the government that came on board then destroyed whatever fabric we had in terms of each region of the country 
you know, favorably competing with one another. I mean, everybody was developing at their own pace before the country was forcibly unified into one unitary entity so that each region now cannot compete with one another again. You have a centralized government instead of power devolving to the, to the region. If you are going to talk politically, I think you should have taken it from that. So in terms of, let me ask you, um, Honorable Odo, in terms of the civil war, is there a conversation still there or it's closed? Because what we're discussing this evening or night is how do we move forward as a united Nigeria? Yes, I uh, see the issue of civil war. We must appreciate the fact that civil war did not happen in Nigeria during a civilian regime. It happened during the military. And uh, everybody knows that military government should not be the best for any country. Like my brother said about the genesis of what caused, uh, you know, what imported the unitary system of Nigeria, making uh, references to the 1966 um, coup. This is our military. A military man who is your younger brother remains a military man. Their thinking is different. If you begin to assess a military man from where he's coming from, you're getting the point out rightly. I mean, you're getting the point uh, all off the track. The military has a way of doing things, and how do they do it? They try to coerce everybody, to capture everybody, and that was what actually brought what you saw as a unitary system of government. Because don't forget that they suspend the entire legislature. Don't forget that even within the executive, people receive orders. What we are talking is that things have not gone so bad. Yes, we might be suffering some... What is happening in Nigeria currently is suspicion. And then how do we erase those suspicion? You erase because why people are circumspect about who becomes the president, who becomes what, is because there is every presumption that whoever that becomes president or becomes a governor has the tendency of favoring his people more. So because of that, people now became suspicious. There was lack of trust. Everybody is clamoring for my own people to be there. In fact, it went to the extent that even if when somebody commits crime, especially on a embezzlement, and then the person is being tried or jailed, you see his people coming <laughs> to defend him, you know, trying to uh, ethnicize Corruption, fraud, and what have you. So oh, 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 okay. we can we, we can come to a middle point through discussion, through telling ourselves the truth, and then moving away forward. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay, so uh, Dr. Mike, you have the last question uh, um, answer in in six uh, seconds or less. Um, a lot of people have given up on Nigeria. What do we do to inspire hope? No, no, don't give up on this country. It's a space that you can exploit maximally to get benefits. This is a land of possibilities, it's not a land of potentials. Nigeria has it in terms of the people we have, the relationships we can build, and the nation that is waiting, to t that, uh, you know, waiting for us to tap from it. Let us not give up on this country. It has, it's still, it's still it's a place to be. Well, that's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Do join us again from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching and thank you to our guests.